Um, so I think you already had enough talks about full dentics, but just in case you're not yet sure what this is all about, uh, here is yet another talk which describes a bit the status, the status, current status of Linux dentics. So, um, oh, it's going to be a very boring talk for many of you because, well, we have a very advanced public. So, uh, but never mind. I'm going to. Um, uh, try to remind you what the tick is about. So uh, this is a periodic event, a periodic interrupt that happens uh, from 100 to 1,000 times per second. Um, well, it depends from the architectures, actually. I don't know, maybe, maybe some architectures uh, support other further ranges. But uh, this is a per CPU event. Um, so in x86, it can be also some middle, middle values, but anyway. So this shows you a bit uh, what uh, is the difference if you have a very high frequency compared to, uh, to a low one like 100. So the difference uh, between uh, a low frequency and high frequency, um, well, low frequency is usually more dedicated for performance, rough put oriented workload like servers, I mean, traditionally. Uh, because the CPU is, of course, less stolen, and also there is, uh, the, the cache is less often disturbed to, uh, to serve the interrupt. Uh, on the other hand, a high frequency is better, actually was better for latency, uh, timer and scheduler, responsiveness. Um, for example, some syscalls like Paul or EPO had better, uh, have better granularity. No, had, actually, because nowadays we have high-resolution timer, which reduce, actually, this impact. So I'm actually not sure there is, nowadays, a very, very big difference between 100 and 1,000, at least on, on uh, file polling. Um, so the most important duty uh, served by the TIC is the timekeeping maintenance. Um, timekeeping is about maintaining two timestamps, mostly. Uh, the first one is the get time of day timestamp. So it's an absolute timestamp uh, used uh, by user space. And uh, GFIS is like the opposite. It's a relative timestamp, only, I hope, only used by the kernel. And uh, only its relative value is interesting because uh, Anyway, on the boot, we give it a random value, so you'd better never rely on its absolute value. Um, the tick also maintains a set of timers, which has the granularity uh, you give with the hertz frequency. Um, so, like uh, in this picture, you just enqueue a timer on a given time, and uh, it's uh, it has a relative expiry time, so if you schedule a timer which expires uh, two GFIs later, it's going to uh, be served uh, two, GFI, two uh, ticks later. Uh, the tick also has other duties, like maintaining POSIX CPU timers, but it's really about details, so I'm not going to describe that further, but also uh, CPU time statistics, which is about um, accounting the time spent in user space, kernel space, and sometimes some more fine-grain, uh, some finer-grain details like IRQ time, soft IRQ time. Um, and the tick is widely used by the scheduler for, um, in order to maintain local and global fairness. Local fairness with preemption, uh, guaranteeing the share of tasks is well balanced on the single CPU, and also global fairness with the load balancing. And also used by RCU. <laughs> no details. <laughs> um, is it free? Of course not. Um, the first biggest program I think we had in history with uh, the TIC was its uh, impact on the power consumption. Because the tick uh, often fires, um, uh, of, of, uh, uh, fires in idle as well as in busy uh, state CPU. So I stole this picture from uh, Paul's talk. Uh, it won't be the first, uh, the, the only one I, I stole actually. There are some more. So, uh, 
I planned to remove them, but um, was too lazy. Uh, Dintix idle so has been the first uh, shape of um, dynamic tick frequency setting. So it has been merged several years ago in order to solve the power consumption issues, right? Well, it was traditionally config no hertz, but it has been lately renamed. Uh, but we kept no hertz for compatibility. So the effect is obvious. It tries to remove the tick when we can on idle, unless there are some timer callback to invoke. But uh, we can run into um, scenarios where the tick can be completely removed on idle time slice. Um, uh, the, 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 the upside on the, on the um, power consumption that comes along Dintix idle is not only due to the fact that there are less interrupts and so less wake up uh, of the CPU from low power mode, but also because uh, the CPU can enter into deep, uh, deep power saving state. So it's a game most of the time. Um, now there are s some problems remaining with the fact that the tick is still there on, when the CPU is busy, uh, disturbing it 100 to 1,000 times per second. So there, there is some measurable impact, and uh, not only because the time, the CPU time is stolen, but also because the uh, instruction and data cache are periodically trashed. So. Again, picture stolen from Paul Stock, which shows you uh, what happens when, the, when Linux disturbs the CPU when actually there is no need for that. For example, when the CPU runs in user space. So who complains uh, with, um, with this problem? Well, two extreme workloads, uh, high performance computing, complain because of the CPU time stolen and, and trash cache. So Apparently, there is one to three persons measurable uh, performance impact, apparently. And also real time, because uh, real time workloads try to avoid critical sections when the CPU is not preemptible. And uh, since the timer, uh, timer interrupt is not threaded, uh, it's an occasion for the CPU not to be preemptible. So, problem also in real time. Um, so we now want to, to try to stop the tick on busy CPUs. Um, a baby state solution has been merged back in 3.10. Um, but the problem is that stopping the tick uh, when the CPU is busy comes at some expense because we have to convert a lot of uh, poll driven code from subsystems to one shot event driven code. So, for example, the CPU time has been traditionally accounted by the tick. Uh, when the tick interrupts the CPU, it checks where the interrupt happened and then accounts the time uh, to the appropriate statistics per CPU statistics. So, uh, and of course, the more, the, the higher the frequency is and the better, the, the more precise statistics you have with such a, such a scheme. So, um, uh, the conversion that we have been using with uh, Foldintix has been to set probes on uh, every kernel user space entry exit boundaries, like syscalls, exceptions, and RQs. Um, some subsystems, uh, some architectures were doing this already natively, like um, uh, Super H, I think, PowerPC, and also, uh, I don't remember, oh yeah, uh, IA64. Uh, and so um, with the full Dynetix, we have been trying to convert that to generic code and uh, minimize the architecture code to just setting hooks on the syscall exceptions and RQs. So now, the, for example, the CPU uh, is in the kernel space, exits, uh, resumes to user space, saves uh, the GFIS time, 
And then the next time we uh, re-enter the kernel, we compute the delta time and account this. So this is event-driven, uh, an event one-shot driven uh, conversion. Um, but the big problem with this solution is, of course, the hooks overhead because, well, we, we, have, we have had some cares to uh, minimize the syscall exception and RQ entry exit code, and now we are setting quite big hooks on these places. So, uh, of course, there is... I haven't measured myself the, um, the impact, but I'm, I'm pretty sure there is there is quite some uh, significant uh, issues with that. So it's mostly useful for workloads that are very, uh, very CPU, very CPU workloads and, and not IO workloads where you have a lot of back and forth in the kernel. Mm-hmm, sorry? Yep. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, what I might do, mm -hmm. which, um, given, the, given the chance I do, is I organize my processes so that I might have a thread running, and his job is to never make a system call and just do a big compute log flow. Okay, but even if you, well, even if you, you don't do much system calls, you, you always have some kernel entry exits. Yeah. But then if you arrange your application not to go to the kernel very often, so that's not a problem because in this case you don't enter these hooks. So anyway, it's not, it's not a problem. In fact, as long as you stay mostly in user space, nothing happens. What? <laughs> okay. Um, Oh, you mean if you have an application that is mostly CPU bound, and on the other hand, you have some applications that are random, random loads? Which, which has been known to happen on, on, you know, on a uh, Linux or other um, multi, you know, larger systems. Okay, but my app, you're running your app, and yeah, but eventually you you need to to account the time you have spent in user space when you so exit. You're not, so you're not concerned about the fairness issue. Well, I, I don't. Well, it works also if you... I just appreciate that. If you look at a task, that doesn't matter. Actually, we actually can see the text, right? Right. That's the default setting. All right. Okay, so... So, um, sorry. Uh, so RCU uh, has been one of the biggest problems when we when we have implemented. <laughs> Paul has been the biggest problem when we have implemented. <laughs> no, actually, he he, he he actually solved most of the issue. So, um, so um, especially okay. I'm doing a, a very little reminder uh, on RCU. This is a, a read side uh, a, a lockless. Synchronization based on a read site that can run concurrently with uh, writers. And uh, this is about object lifecycle synchronization, not really strict locking, but anyway, I cannot really enter into details. So, um, but C RCU relies on accounting when the CPU doesn't use RCU, which, which is a state that we call a quiescent state. So every time if there is a quiescent state, uh, the CPU reports that if there is uh, an RCU grace period that has been started. So one, uh, for, when, when the CPU starts a grace period, because it has enqueued a callback to execute at the end of the grace period, every CPU has to report this uh, a quiescent state in order to, to complete the grace period. So this is, this is a really big deal for RCU. 
And this, um, qua these quiescent states reporting are based <coughs> traditionally on the tick. So the CPU pulls on the CPU, uh, the tick pulls on the CPU, and then uh, if it sees that it's interrupted um, code section that is not using RCU read side, uh, it reports a grace period. But um, this has been a problem in the past for uh, when, when idle, Dintix idle has been brought to mainline because when the CPU was idle, the, the tick was still pulling on, on quiescent state. So we had to, Paul had to solve this uh, by implementing what we call today an extended grace period. So uh, a CPU enters an extended grace period when it runs idle because idle means that the CPU is not using RC. What? Quiescent state. I, I'm not pronouncing it well, pro probably. Extended grace, yeah, no. Extended quiescent state. Actually, extended grace period is when... Uh, extended grace period ha is what happens when you have a CPU without tick while actually running on the kernel. But, okay, anyway. So... Uh, extended quiescent state is the, say, the state uh, on the CPU goes when it runs idle, and this way it goes off the global state machine, so it doesn't need to report any more quiescent state. So this way we can spare the, the timer tick on the CPUs that are idle. Um, now the problem is that if we want to... Um, if we want to, to remove the tick on busy CPUs, we need to um, apply also this extended quiescent state to uh, user space because user space doesn't use RC. Okay. Okay. Because, okay, actually it's wrong. User space actually use RCU, but that's because there is an implementation of, of RCU in user space, but it's completely separated from the kernel RCU. So. Our user space doesn't use the RC read side critical sections from the kernel. So we can consider the world user space code in extended quiescent state. So this is what we have implemented. Again, reusing the syscalls exception hooks, uh, RQ, entry, exit hooks. Uh, this, is, this has been implemented in a, in a separate configuration to ease testing for architectures that implement that. So this has made the index possible in, uh, in user space. Okay, uh, apparently I'm running over time. Um, maybe I can spare the, okay, timekeeping. We also had to find solution for timekeeping in order to implement full Dintix. Um, so we took the very easy solution first. Uh, we keep the boot CPU uh, with the tick even when it runs idle. So the full Dintix CPU can um, use and maintain progressing timekeeping even if we run in full Dintix. But now we have a new solution that uh, has been merged on the last merge window. Um, so Paul has talked about that uh, several hours ago. Um, so this is the full idle detection. Um, well, yeah. Sorry? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know that's a problem. We have a lot of config options that are needed to, uh, to, uh, to enable the full Dintix, but that's what first um, made that way to, to uh, ease the path for architectures to bring support. But yeah, I think that in the end we are going to pack uh, most of these config options into, into one option, unless they prove to be used by other subsystems. So. What? Yeah, right. Well, that's what we have uh, today. We have. Mm -hmm. That's what we have today. When, we, when you select uh, full Dintix, it enables uh, users, uh, RCU user, quiescent states, and you know, many things. 
Yeah, the, the worry I have is that if this is used by other subsystems yeah, later. Mm -hmm. Mm. But it's very, it's very error prone to have so many config options. Yeah, that's really not something I think we, we are going to keep in the, in the long run. Yeah. Wait, uh, one, one second. Where is that? Oh, the one, one hertz? Yeah. yeah. No, no, that's not something we want to keep in the long run. No, 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 no. No, this is actually a hack to, to make the scheduler still working because scheduler is, was relying on the, that big kernel timer on correctness. So I need to dig into the various scheduler callbacks and see what relies on the periodicity of the tick. But yeah, this is really a hack that we want to remove in the long run. Um, Yeah, there is also the, the big constraint of having only one task running on the CPU to, to enable full DINTIX. So that too is something that we want to remove in the long run. Maybe using high resolution tick. Um, so if we have several tasks competing on the CPU, we need preemption. Uh, I mean, we need local fairness, so we need to maintain that. Maybe with high resolution timer tick. So that's an option. But the Apparently, there is some performance problem with the fact that on high resolution tick, there is a lot of clock source writes. Yeah. yeah, a lot. Like every scheduled call, and we have a high resolution timer canceling, for example, canceling or, or rewrite. So, okay, I think we got another view. Oh, I again stole the references of Paul. Okay. The thanks as well. The question. Questions? Okay, I think I, I confused everybody. Yeah. Any evidence that one? Well, it's a it's a problem if uh, a pro because some um, yeah real time if real time relies on the fact that re there is really no tick uh, to disturb the CPU. Um, because yeah. Yeah, what one hertz is probably not a problem in, for throughput, but uh, for a guarantee of latencies, yeah. Yeah, so it's a correctness issues more than throughput performance. Mm -mm. Okay.